Hello, fellow fans, and welcome to my fourth video featuring a conversation with a Transformers legend. Today, I'll be speaking with the wonderful Greg Berger. Transformers fans will know him best as the voice of Grimlock in the G1 cartoon, a role he would later reprise in the Transformers Devastation game, as well as the Power of the Primes cartoon. Talking to Greg is always a treat. You don't just have a conversation with one of the friendliest actors out there, but you also learn something at the same time. And this conversation was no exception, and it was an absolute joy. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Greg Berger. Hello, Greg. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Boy, I only go where I'm invited, so uh, <laughs> that, makes, that makes this an easy yes. You are I'm always all, welcome here. <laughs> and I'm always happy to spend time with you. Thank you so, so much. It's a, it's a mutual admiration society. Oh, I and and I have missed talking to you, so I consider this an absolute treat. All right, so vice vice versa. The way I've been beginning these interviews, whether it's an actor or a writer or anyone, is I'm always curious what led you down this path because my life path it definitely didn't lead me towards acting or writing or anything like that. And I'm curious where did that spark come from that turned you towards acting. In truth, there are several origin stories, but probably the most pronounced in answer to that question, and also making the larger point that if you're wise, not only do you seek the direction that you seek, but if your direction chooses to find you, be wise enough to listen. Uh, I was going to school in upstate New York at a very well-known uh, university, and I was an English major, and I had a great friend who was in the theater department. They were casting a play, uh, English drawing room farce, dark comedy, a Joe Orton play. Uh, he said, you know, he said, you always tell stories and you instinctively uh, or intuitively go into character while you're telling stories, you're facile with dialects. Would you come and read for this uh, show because they're going outside of the department. They're having trouble filling this part. So I literally got dragged uh, voluntarily. I, there wasn't much dragging involved to this audition. And uh, I got the part and opening night, the head of the theater department said, what are you doing in the English department? And I said, <laughs> I don't know. I'll, I'll teach English or maybe I'm pre-law. I don't know who I am. Uh, I'm just finding out. He said, don't stop doing what you're doing. But he said, by all means, if we can convince you, let include this in your interests and in your pursuit. He said, you're just the kind of actor that we like to feed and nourish and grow and uh, he said I, I see great possibility for you and so um, I, I kind of uh, had someone lift me from my direction and put me on a different direction which I am still passionate about you know I'm not that kid actor who grew up jaded and and uh, took it all for granted it was all fresh um, I love performing. I can't say it's it fills some psych psychological need in me to. I I don't do it for the audience. I do it for myself. I love it. I loved it then. I tell students when you if you put a script in my hand right now, I'm Cinderella going to the ball. I don't know. I don't know what sensors it is, but I feel my brain light up like like uh, what you want. Uh, when you are passionate about something. And uh, just to expand the conversation, I, I'm not concerned for a generation that's passionate about anything, whatever that is, as long as it's positive. But I, I'm referring specifically to the convention generations, plural, because kids, I mean, people, kids of all ages bring their kids of all ages. And um, it's just a, a very festive, loyal, loving, fun, funny atmosphere that I that I really, truly enjoy. Um, it's a long answer to your short question, but there you are. The generation that I worry about and that concerns me is the one that clings to the word whatever. <laughs> I worry about whatever, you know, because... Uh, 
there's so much to reach out and grab. And if you go the other direction and, and seek nothing, you get nothing. And it just sounds like a colossal waste of, uh, of the potential for, for, for great stuff. But that's just me. What do I know? I think um, it's an interesting point because I've, I, I've met some younger folks like that, you know, some I'm related to, and they sometimes put that as a front and, but they're really deep down inside. They're waiting for someone to ask them or, or say to them, Hey, that thing you're doing is interesting or what interests you. And it sounds like someone did that with you when you were younger is they, they kind of saw a spark in you and they said you know what this is something we should cultivate and and i think that's a wonderful way to start generating that spark is a great uh thing for any of us to do paying it forward is a great thing for any of us to do asking younger people you know what is it what is it that that you get excited about what what is it you'd like to be doing mm -hmm. not not that you don't have to be a realist at some point but you don't have to be a realist at every point right <laughs> go for it want something and seek it and do whatever's in your power to achieve it and and um uh, that's not to say there's astronomical odds against some of this it's not to say that there's not a million things that are outside your control, but mm -hmm. embrace those things that are within your control and go for it. Go for something. And I think you may have just answered, partially answered my next question, which is, uh, it's one thing to have a desire to act. It's another thing to want to turn that into your life, but it's another thing to make that leap and say, okay, this is how I'm going to pay the bills. This is how I'm going to live my life and put food on my table. Um, for me, someone who works basically an office job, you know, nine to five, um, it's like, that's what all, all I've ever known since I was in high school, really. Um, and I'm, and I'm okay with that. You know, I, I like the consistency and so on. And I've always admired people who work in the entertainment industry because it takes a certain leap of faith, I think, to in yourself and in what's out there, right? The world to say, I'm going to make this jump into this industry i know i don't have a nine to five to go to five days a week but that's okay like this is what i'm passionate about um let me go do this uh how did you find that within yourself well <laughs> i'm gonna attribute it to uh equal parts optimism terminal optimism it'll kill me someday but i get to die with a smile on my face mm -hmm. uh naivete stupidity <laughs> and and dogged stubborn determination um all of those things like i said odds against astronomical yeah. and and saying this is how i'm going to pay the bills no one knows whether that is the case or even if it remains the case you have to do it because you love it and the, the cliche is if you love what you're doing, it, you know, it's not work, mm -hmm. but, but there is work attached to getting the work that you love doing. There are specifics uh, of becoming industry savvy so that, you know, if you're lucky, you meet the wrong people first so that you can do your best work for the right people when you meet them further down the line. But that's, that's very difficult to hold on to when you're starting out and every interview every audition first you have to determine if you're going to a coast if you're going to a coast or a, a media a center an industry hub where will that be if it's not where you already live then there's a gigantor leap of faith to uh leave that place that you're from hopefully with the with the comfort of knowing you can always go home but you still have to jump off that cliff and, and go somewhere and announce yourself. Less so these days, uh, which are so digitally dominated, where, where you literally can be anywhere if you have a connection, uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, internet connection, you can at least appear where you need to be. That's not to say you, if you were to book something and had to be in a studio tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., that's when it can become awkward and embarrassing if you're, if you're on a mountaintop in Tennessee. <laughs> um, 
hey, I think I hear Beverly Hillbillies theme song <laughs> in the background. Uh, what, who's that? There's there's Granny on the on the roof of the pickup. Uh, anyway, uh, I I I uh, I love when that dogged determination and stubbornness, in the best sense of the word, is rewarded. Uh, but there's no guarantee of that, and there's no guarantee that it's for a lifetime. My uh, my agent who was just vital to to quantum leaping me into the career that I had still says and said at that time the way to create a career is one job at a time mm. exceed expectation let them know you were there uh, I say if you want to be remembered be memorable uh, you know uh, don't waste people's time uh, if you if you are the guy or woman or girl behind that microphone, uh, that means you're occupying a space that no one else is in at that time. And I've done a lot of stage and television and film and on camera and off camera. And, uh, you know, the sweet spot has become animation, interactive gaming, things that, uh, that I use my voice for. But even for on camera, I've always sort of, had voice inspired on camera roles I, I i once i figure out what someone sound what a character sounds like the rest of it falls into place um but that's me you know that's my little chameleon thing but but that that uh makes me feel great in a in a different way uh that's how i enjoy approaching the work i i like figuring out that character and if it's voiceover, it can be any size, any species, any <laughs> gender, if you do it uh, the right way. Um, you know, there's no there's no limitations. And and uh, so it's it's kind of a delicious detective story to sort of figure out a character in three dimensions and uh, grow yourself into it. Boy, I'm giving the longest winded answers. This is to good the, stuff, though. To the shortest questions. <laughs> hey, just I just I throw them wind out there. me up, and I and I keep, <laughs> I keep going till the battery runs exactly. out. Exactly. I want you to take it as I want you to freeform it and take it where you want to go. Um, so from that time you did that play, and 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 that and you were encouraged to act more. Uh, did you then pivot into doing more formal training uh, to get into acting? Not only that, uh, total pivot, but but still doing what th that initial uh, advice was, which is hanging on to my English credits as well. So long story, this time, long story short, I ended up with a double major because I had enough credits to graduate with a double major. But um, I left Colgate University, which was in upstate New York, and returned to my hometown, St. Louis, and went to a theater conservatory, which, which was uh, just an extraordinary opportunity to explore all aspects. And it was doubly extraordinary because our, uh, re the resident, it, it was located where there was a resident company repertory theater. So the faculty, the acting faculty of our conservatory was also the resident company uh, m many of them, uh, of the repertory theater. So all day we were subject to their criticism, but at 8 PM every night, they were subject to our criticism. <laughs> so uh, that is a really outstanding learning opportunity because you have to not only be able to teach it, you have to be able to do it. Uh, so there was mu mad mutual respect and a lot of growth. And I ended up doing uh being sort of drawn into to that repertory company and and did shows with them and for them as well as a student and a little bit uh, afterwards as well and and you've seen the industry change quite a bit over the years i'm sure you you, you kind of alluded to some of it earlier uh, you know when you were talking about how the acting isn't necessarily in person anymore necessarily uh, i got this flashback because I, I you know some of my friends are voice actors on twitter and I follow their Twitter feeds and they'll post these photos of these, um, they're in a hotel room and they'll put like a makeshift 
sound room together basically or sit in the closet guilty right? done it <laughs> Uh, there's pillows involved. I saw someone create something out of an ironing board with pillows around. It was it's amazing what folks come up with. And um, I was a, I was an <laughs> iron ironing board guy. It, uh, I had a whole console set up on the ironing board. Uh-huh. Uh, I put two mattresses from the room together into a sound <laughs> tent over my head and recorded sitting on the floor. You you know any port in a storm. But we're all uh, at our best when we're inventive and creative. I don't think that was the kind of improv they originally <laughs> were talking <laughs> Not about. Not really. Though, right? <laughs> so, you, you know, you get into the acting career, and I think what most of our viewers right now who are watching this video are thinking is, well, how did you get involved in Transformers? What in your uh, acting path led you uh, to Sunbow and, and, and recording what has become a legendary series at this point? Like I said, there are many origin stories and another of the origin stories, but it speaks to the larger point of opportunity is only opportunity when you seize it. You have to recognize it for what it is. Um, I was auditioning for everything, primarily uh, theater and courting agencies and agents and doing all the things that you do when you're announcing yourself to a town that doesn't know that you exist. Well, um, I had gotten representation. I'd gotten sent on uh, the West Coast version, the West Coast company of a play that started in New York. I, I was cast and then found out that I was cast as an understudy covering uh, actually a total of four roles, two, oh, wow. char- two characters who each played two parts. By the way, that's where I met uh, Paul Eiding because oh. we, we were both in, in the play together. Um, and that's how long we've known each other, which wow. is 30 years plus. Is this one of those, uh, this wasn't the, the dinner theater place, was it? No. Okay. This, okay. This this uh, was a Carol Churchill play. It was the New York Company uh, yeah. coming to s- become an LA company, uh, but I was cast as that understudy, and I, in weaker moments, thought I'll never go on. No one right. will ever see me. I have to put in all of this work. Oh, uh, and you know what? What for? What for? But not really. I I loved being in the theater every every night and being part of that company. Well, the night came that one of the two characters that I was covering had car trouble or whatever. So I had a half an hour of adrenaline overload, uh, getting <laughs> ready to go on. I, I had, a, I mean, uh, with all due respect, a, a fantastic first performance for an audience. So much so that after the the, that performance as the understudy going on, Gordon Hunt, who was doing all of the uh, voice direction at Hanna-Barbera in those days, came backstage and asked to see me. And uh, I came out and uh, I thought, this is opportunity. This, this right here, this is, this is opportunity happening. I've got to be do something that won't be forgotten. If I say thank you, he'll forget it by the time he gets to the car. He said, if you're as versatile as what I just saw on stage, we should know about you at Hanna-Barbera. I said, you've had my demo for a couple of months now. If you could move it from the bottom of the pile to the top, I want to be where you take, uh, I want I want to go to there. Yes. Um, he laughed. Uh, he called me in uh, less than a week later for a peripheral role he introduced me he said uh, can you imagine the nerve of this guy he busted me and i totally loved it (laughs) and he said to me uh he he said you got a lot of nerve huh i said absolutely normally not sometimes at my own expense but i wasn't gonna let that moment go by yeah and um You know, it it began what was a long association with Hanna-Barbera. Wally Burr also saw me another night that I went on in that same play. Uh, I had been doing, the first thing I ever got was a show called The Littles that Wally Burr directed. When he saw me in Cloud Nine on stage, he said, I had no idea how versatile you were. I'm going to think of you for everything. 
Wow. And he said, I'm working on a gigantic project, uh, two shows at once, G.I. Joe and Transformers. Uh, now, when you went into Wally Burr Studios to audition, he was smart enough to put essentially all of the roles out on a table and he would say, pick three that are best for you. He didn't, uh, he, there was no, there was no corner to be painted into. You decided what your best representation of you was. And one of the pieces of copy I picked up was Grimlock. I think one was Long Haul. Um, and the one may have been Skyfire, um, depending on when they came into the franchise. But this was early on. This was the original casting and everybody in town was there and, I was um, the new kid, to be honest with you. And uh, Wally called me uh, and he said, uh, he said, I have a question for you. I said, yes. And he said, uh, Hasbro loves you and Sunbow oh. loves you for Grimlock. But is that a voice that you can only audition with? Or are you going to be able to maintain and sustain it? Mm -hmm. And uh, me thought about it <laughs> anyway. I said, put me in coach. I, I, I will, I will make this happen. I will, I will never disappoint you. I would love to be doing this. So um, that, that kind of is how it happened, but you know, all of these stories, I'm sure you can hear the interweaving threads, but you, 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 you can't mistake these moments for anything other than what they are. And I'm optimistic enough to believe that opportunities make themselves possible for everyone but not everyone recognizes them uh the need to seize them as, as for all your worth and as tightly as you can and not let them go by yeah and, and how um i mean doing a voice like grimlocks i imagine i mean it's one thing to do it really quickly in a botcon panel right it's another thing to do it day in and day out and my understanding from conversations at botcon and so on mm -hmm. is while it could be a demanding taskmaster and he he took multiple takes of uh certain lines was that a challenge as well there's a two-part answer and one is that because of that show that was one of the the key components in uh negotiations within our union to uh limit the the amount of session time that that had been eight hours and actually was reduced to four hours seemed to be oh. an appropriate amount of time to get uh, an episode of something done um you know i would say he was a firm taskmaster but look at the result mm -hmm. he you know he had the foresight to see what he uh, envisioned and not to accept anything less than what he needed i don't think that is demanding i think that is uh, inspired and and uh to his credit uh he wanted to make something for generations plural and that's exactly what he did and still you know kids that are introduced to later incarnations of transformers because of the hub because of netflix because of opportunities that have arisen be as we become a streaming civilization, mm -hmm. uh, younger generations find their way back to G1. Yeah. They, they love the characters. They love the story. They love the story. The fact that the story is character driven. Um, and, you know, the technology, uh, digital technology and anim computer animation, all of those things have evolved, but you still... I maintain if you don't care about the characters, you don't care about what happens to them. And you don't care if, if the graphics have improved. You don't, you, you, you latch on to characters and you want to go for the ride with them. And I've learned so much as an actor from Transformers and from G.I. Joe, because not only was I gifted with phenomenally uh, fun, funny, interesting, intense characters, to to uh play but i've been given arcs that mm -hmm. seem uh, particularly grimlock 
uh, it's very hard to get back to square one. They gave him a new brain for heaven's <laughs> sake. You know, uh, you, you get there uh, on day one and find out you have a new brain. And by, by the end of recording, you have to have uh, passed it on because you think you were more effective uh, before. I've talked to Simon Furman about uh, uh, the uh, the cartoon strip, uh, some of the car the comic books, uh, and he's told me that there there are some takes on Grimlock over time. Some of which are that he's actually much smarter than he lets on because he functions better not letting on. You know, uh, it, it it's a really intriguing character, and a lot of people have have taken it a lot of directions. When High Moon uh, hired me for uh, 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 Fall of Cybertron, uh, they told me they actually were were kind of juggling uh, Transformers canon to to uh, to allow it to become more cinematic and dark and film like, uh, and that was just a joy. For me to be able to to give it that kind of uh, a deeper darker cinematic life um it just it, it's been a really beautiful beautiful ride and continues to be uh i uh i would like to uh to be able to say uh that uh, past present and hopefully uh presumably uh future uh uh grimlock's been very good to me and i hope i've been very good to grimlock well, how how fun is it that you you've been asked back so many times to play Grimlock, um, and you know most recently the Power of the Prime series where you, it wasn't just a game or something like that; it was actually several episodes of a show. Absolutely, and it uh, and it really I think probably was the closest to your original portrayal um, of all the different times you've done it. Uh, how did it feel just to even be asked and you know and then actually do it? Well. Keep in mind, me no dice dino, me no kisser, me no bozo, me king. It's it's the greatest thing in the world to or to to create something, to be able to put your name to something, to be able to sit and watch social media and have someone post an image of of Grimlock, and while I'm watching, <laughs> have someone else tag my name to it. Right, that means something to me to be invited back and to be invited back and to be, uh, I, I think the term uh, in Transformer world is kind of part of the realignment where, where the past is the present and the present is the future. And um, there are lots of Transformers uh, stories, uh, by the way, which fandom is unbelievably loyal and willing to just uh, take the ride, even if the ride has some detours and diversions and finds its way back. Uh, it means everything to me. Uh, it, honestly, at this point, it's a franchise that's nearly as as real as as the real world. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, there's a there, there's a T-shirt that instead of straight out of Compton, it says straight out of Cybertruck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's fantastic and. And the audiences, including and in particular convention audiences that it's introduced me to just means the world to me. I really, truly love being a part of this franchise. Well, what your first BotCon was 2001, I think, ish. Um, hope I'm remembering that right. Early 2000s. If it was, uh, if it, if memory serves, which it don't, uh, <laughs> it was Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, and uh, I was with Michael Bell and uh, John Stevenson. I I believe that was the first one I went to. How? Um, because because I mean, at the end of the day, especially let's you know let's rewind a bit. So around eighty seven, eighty eight or so, the adventure was kind of over, right, for the original series, and and you moved on to other projects. And I know for some actors and writers as well, uh, when a project ends, that's just it. You know, the play's over, it's shut down. We had a great time, we move on, right? Um, and I don't think a lot of actors, at least back then, expected that they were going to circle back around and come back to a franchise. Um, and when you showed up at that BotCon and all of a sudden you had this room full of people, including myself, who were just, you know, kind of fawning over you <laughs> like a rock star, uh, was that a surprise that there was this dedicated fan base that had held on all those years? 
was an absolute, absolute mind blower. <laughs> and uh, Michael Bell and I got in an elevator together to go up to, uh, you know, uh, we had just gotten our room keys. And we got in the elevator, and before the elevator door closed, there were at least 12 other people in the elevator <laughs> staring at us. And I, I I, thought my nose was running, or I, 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 I didn't. And then somebody spoke, and somebody else spoke, and, and people said, you have no idea how much love and loyalty and respect uh, there is in this hotel for you yeah. this weekend, in this world for you, in this fandom for you, in, and, and, you know, it was, it was just like a gigantic thank you card um, from, <laughs> there were thousands of people there. Uh, and there are always thousands of people or however many the fire marshal will allow. Uh, <laughs> it's been that way ever since. But they uh, it was fandom who sat me down and told me uh, sort of brought me up to speed on where Transformers had gone since my departure, how how they wanted it to sort of realign itself and, and find a way to include more generations uh, in in the future. And uh I mean, I believe it's it's if not the most vocal fandom, maybe uh, within the top few, because um, I know that that Hasbro has been receptive to uh, sort of fan demand and fan interest. I got introduced to fan fiction. I got it was all extraordinary to me because, like you said, you kind of have no choice but to. Uh, let go of things when they sort of subside and go away, but you have no sense uh, of their ability to come back, or certainly not in those days. Uh, it, it was extraordinary. Um, you know, I've met people who uh, hung a lot of their, not hung, but uh, uh, sort of invested a lot of their life, uh, which was challenging, or their health, which was challenged, or their things that I had no idea that I had a positive influence on simply by doing what it was that I was doing. Well, I've had that knowledge ever since, and I don't take anything for granted uh, in that department. Conventions were in their, uh, not infancy, but they, they weren't what they are now. They've mm -hmm. become a phenomenon. I have had the great good fortune of being invited all over the world uh, and fly 6,000, 9,000 miles to get to a signing table or a, a Q&A panel where people are lined up around the, the building uh, trying to get in. I mean, it, it, it is... I tell people it's it's empowering and humbling at the exact same time because um, um, the work that I've done has had uh, an influence and an impact on people that I didn't even know I was connected to by our mutual investment in the work itself. And little did you or any of the others uh, who are in that studio with you in 84 know that you were part of the foundation of something that would become, uh, I think, a, a, a pop culture cornerstone um, nowadays. Um, we can credit it to a lot of things, you know, uh, nostalgia for the 80s or the 90s, um, the live action movies. We, we can put a lot of pins in where we think it became a, a cultural phenomenon, but the, it's hard for you to walk out into the street you could probably pick 10 random people off the street and ask them do you know what a transformer is and at least six of them will probably know uh -huh. <laughs> uh, cesium salami beryllium baloney uh, now uh, and they must be extraordinary just realizing you were at the ground floor of that you didn't know it at the time no one knew it at the time but you were but that's that's the whole that that that's what's extraordinary about it. Um, I don't know if you're a fan of of uh, the comedy show SCTV or the Second City people that mm -hmm. created SCTV, but they said uh, I, I I went to an evening honoring them, and they said they were in uh, you know neck deep snow in the middle of Edmonton uh, 
doing what they thought was funny, but it was it, they, they had no sense of their audience yet. So they just kept doing the show that they would want to see. And when it had that degree of success, they, feel, they felt like it came out of a vacuum. There was no, just like us, there was no immediate audience response. You didn't know if you were resonating or if you weren't, or if you were there for uh, an episode or episodes, or if it was going to go on. Then comes the news that you're picked up. Then comes the news that the, the ratings are going through the roof. You know, all this stuff, um, that, that sometimes an audience assumes that you know, but you don't know when you're in the birthing process of something brand new and something different. And, and uh, it's so rewarding when, when it's embraced, when, when an audience holds on to it. And, and now going back to that studio in the 80s, uh, you all, as I understand it, got to do something which I think is becoming a little more rare nowadays, which is you all got to get together and record uh, episodes as a group. Um, I think nowadays it's almost more common, partly because of the pandemic, for people to record individually and then editors later work together. You know, they work their magic and bring the piece together. But um, I have heard ensemble recording is a very special thing uh, for the actors involved. Do you have any fond memories of that time and any thoughts on group versus individual recording? Uh, I just, uh, I, I feel bad for the new generation of animation actors because so very few projects are done ensemble. And I think, uh, and it doesn't matter whether it's mm -hmm. uh, Garfield and Friends and, and it's, it, it's fun, funny, uh, comedy, or if it's galactic warfare and, and battle for the universe. It's whatever it is, I believe that that energy or intensity or stupidity, uh, <laughs> you know, all of the above, I think they get bigger, better, more spontaneous when we're allowed to play in the same sandbox at the same time. Uh, that can account for a lot of overlap and absolute nightmares for sound, <laughs> sound mixers. Um, but there's a spontaneity to it. Uh, all of the Garfield recordings were done ensemble and honestly still are when, whenever they exist, done ensemble. Um, and uh, if it overlaps, it overlaps. It just, it, there's, there's an air of fun to it that uh, it's really hard to create if you're just isolated and alienated and it's just you and the director and uh, it's put together like a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, you have to sort of anticipate other people's responses sometimes. It's just, it's not connected in the way that ensemble recording used to be connected. Not only that, there's a bigger aspect to it because in Transformers and G.I. Joe, also in, uh, in every series that I've ever been a part of, because you're all there together and at the same time, there's a bonding experience. And these are friendships that I've had for a lifetime. By the way, Dan Gilvezan and I went to college together. We did oh, wow. things together in college. So uh, Transformers in particular has uh, just an extraordinary network of long lifetime friendships for me. Um, and some of them pre even preceded uh, just appearing in Transformers. Um, but it, it, it's phenomenal when that happens. The odds against are ridiculous. Um, but to your question, I, I see it as a sandbox. And yes, you can play in the sandbox all by yourself with a director kind of painting you into and out of scenes. Uh, in interactive gaming, it's almost a necessity because mm -hmm. there's so many eventualities for every scenario and you have to cover all of them. And if it's dying, you have to die 50 <laughs> different ways. Right. You're not the first person to tell me that. <laughs> right. Falling off a cliff, falling off a cliff while flaming arrows are being shot at. <laughs> flaming arrows are being shot at you and you're uh, falling into uh, tree limbs and uh, whatever. <laughs> Uh, aside from your Transformers roles, I mean, just on the poster behind you, we can see, of course, you played uh, a lot oh, of yeah. other roles. When I looked up your IMDb, I mean, this thing, I was going to say it was the length of my arm, but I don't think that's actually going to do it justice. I think it's both my arms. Uh, 
I know, I'm just picking out a few. It's not by all means a complete list, but I know among my childhood favorite roles, putting Transformers aside, I loved Agent K. Uh, I, I have always been a Garfield fan. I grew up a Garfield you know how there was either Garfield or Heathcliff thing? <laughs> yeah. I, I was always pro Garfield. I love Heathcliff too, and I enjoyed that cartoon. But there, there's something about his his uh, his attitude and the the contrast that it played with Odie's positivity <laughs> that was always <laughs> <fun. Yeah>. wow. <laughs> and the little trumpet that would play whenever Odie would come onto the scene. I love. I mean, as a kid, that always made me laugh. Um, but what do you? If you could pick a handful and go as many as you want, what would you, other than Grimlock and, and so on, what would you consider your iconic roles that you would love to spotlight? It's it, it's an embarrassment of riches. I've been, the, the fact that I've been allowed to attach uh, my third dimension to so many animated characters that have become iconic. Of course, oh, longevity has a, has a, is a factor just for pure, number of decades involved with the same characters and the same uh, uh, production teams, et cetera, et cetera. So, so uh, G.I. Joe and Transformers will always be in my uh, absolute uh, uh, favorite because of the arc of the characters, the interest of the characters. Spirit and I share a worldview. He believes that Possibility and impossibility are states of mind. In my mind, there is only the possible, that which can be done. Well, I believe that. And on Garfield and Friends, Orson Pig is probably the closest character anyone's ever written to me. <laughs> Wade, you're afraid of everything made. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> um, you know, Grimlock will always be Grimlock. And, and, uh, Big muscles, small brain. <laughs> I know what to do. Let me at him. Um, so, and Agent K, I came in uh, uh, sort of after the start and, and recovered some stuff. A, a huge fan of the franchise, uh, the, the movie roles. Definitely a, a little tip of the hat to Tommy Lee Jones and says uh shoot him jay they're he's, they're cerebro fecaloids their brains are in their bottoms you know where <laughs> so i mean every one of them for the time that i'm doing them and that's not to soften the answer but they're they're all favorites it's it's an it's extraordinary tie for first place corn fed pig on duck man is one of my absolute favorites someone, <laughs> someone had to save the duck but that was me and Jason Alexander and Dweezil Zappa and Tim Curry and Nancy Travis and Pat Music. And we just had the best time. Uh, Duckman is a favorite for a different reason. On camera, I was cast in um, Police Academy Mission to Moscow. I was flown 9,000 miles to Russia to shoot on location. And Duckman was in its first season. And they sent me with a condenser uh, tape recorder. They would call me in my hotel room, direct me by phone. I would read and they would circle takes on uh, the tape that I was sending back. Um, I would send it back uh, with uh, the, the whatever they were sending back for, for editing from the film. Uh, a courier would pick it up. They told me the quality was so good that had I not been able to get back in time to re-record my lines uh that they could have done production they could have they could have gone with with the the tape that i sent from nine thousand miles away you know that's extraordinary uh oh. you you actually when it's voice over you can be two places at one time it's oh. not easy it's not easy but it's not impossible and long before everyone was zapping their voices over the internet and sending files back and forth by email that's extraordinary Exactly. It was it was a, a cassette tape that or a, a digital audio tape is what it was. Mm -hmm. uh, but but they were able to use it. And so the animators had already started work on the finished show. Uh, then I did what's called ADR, automated dialogue replacement when I got back, which just sweetened it a little bit. But I was I was recording to myself. I was looping myself. Excellent. Now kind of touching uh, springboarding off what you just said there have been a couple instances uh where versions of 
Grimlock were played by someone else, right? Um, and and in one case, uh, the person didn't riff on your performance at all. Um, they kind of did their own thing with the character. And he was written very differently. And then in another case, um, the character sort of riffed on you. Mm-hmm. Um, as someone who is the originator who has carried this torch, even into you know a couple of years ago, right? Uh, is that weird <laughs> when you see a Grimlock and it's not your voice coming out of it? It's uh, it's definitely weird. Uh, it goes to that land that we talked about of things that are outside of your control. Uh, uh, you know, I, I I feel an ownership and an origin uh, of of all of those things, but it goes where it goes. And over time, different people in different positions uh, make different decisions, and. Uh, as much as it kind of stings at the outset, you realize, you know, the world goes where the world goes. Uh, the fact that it's returned after that is, is extre- extremely gratifying. Uh, and every time uh, that I'm asked to return, it's extremely gratifying. Um, but there's the land of things that are within our control and the land of things that are outside of our control. And if you want to stay mentally stable through the course of a lifetime, you got to understand the difference between the two, you know, and life is an exercise in, in letting go. Uh, when it comes back, it's, it's all the sweeter. It really truly is. Agreed. Um, I understand that uh, you teach a class uh, or a workshop. Could you talk a bit about that? I I have done, uh, like I said, I really like the whole notion of paying it forward. Uh, there's things that, it, that Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Outliers that said, anyone is 10,000 hours from dedicated hard work away from mastery of whatever it is <laughs> that they've spent 10,000. So, so, you know, I'm kind of at a point where I can pick up the Stradivarius and I can play it. Uh, and it's just from experience, but along with experience comes uh, a skill set and uh, just a working knowledge and uh, for lack of a better word, wisdom about industry oriented things. So I have done classes, large classes uh, for people who were pursuing work in in animation and voiceover. I am currently, and my dance card is filling quickly, uh, word is getting out, I've been taking some coaching students. And I'm taking advantage of the fact that we are all, uh, at least in the pandemic years, kind of isolated and sitting in remote studios. I'm able using Zoom or any streaming service to to kind of be able to peek over the shoulder of someone as they're recording dialogue that they're being asked to submit or uh, material that we work on together. But it, I'm, I'm hearing them in the space that they're working in one-on-one. It's very intense uh, and intensive. I really love the doing of it and it, it has more of an immediacy than any class possibly could in in a you know a third party studio setting um and it's really uh fulfilling and i believe it's effective and uh the people that i'm coaching i think strongly share that opinion i'm i'm very much enjoying the doing of it and just like this uh it's taking advantage of zoom or the streaming services to accom- to accomplish it it's it's very of the moment, and I, I I really truly enjoy it. That's also an example of how uh, I've heard other actors uh, talk about keeping their skills sharp, um, refining. Right, uh, writers of course do their workshops as well. Um, I, I've always gotten the sense that, especially in the arts, it's not something. It's not a one and done. Right, you don't just get your you know acting degree and then that's it. You're done. Um, that's, there's always that's, growth. That's the beginning. That's yeah. not the end. And like I said about being uh, handed a piece of copy, it, it's always different. You 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 get excited in a way because it's going to be new. If it's a long run of a play, you don't go to the theater every night to do it again. You go to the theater to do it. Right. Every, you know, some 
some set of variants, uh, something is different about every minute of every day. Uh, so you don't do anything again. Uh, if it's a nine to five job, you don't do it again, you do it. Uh, and every day brings new challenges and new, uh, new excitements and maybe new disappointments, but whatever it is, uh, if you're if you're really being here now, if you're really in the moment, it's new. Um, so anyway, I, and what aligns I find uh, with a lot of folks who are in the arts too is, uh, and I trust your taste. Uh, I'm going to ask, are, what are you reading or watching right now that you would recommend? Because I find that often informs uh, performance or writing or you know what you put into your art. Well, my wife and I have really uh, latched onto the whole binging phenomenon, <laughs> and and it's it's we're we're finding shows that we didn't get to uh, first time around. She's uh, in recent uh, in recent months we did the entire Yellowstone saga. We did the eighteen eighty three saga. So we're we're crazy for the Dutton family. <laughs> And we, there's another one coming, right? So nine, I know 19, you're excited. 1932 uh, out <laughs> in December. It, it's really fantastic uh, interpersonal stuff. Uh, just any, any family dynamic is interesting. And then uh, we were in a Western mode, so we had never gone all the way through uh, Deadwood, and we ah. did that, and then we did uh, we did the full Deadwood saga directly into the Deadwood film, uh, and that was thrilling. And uh, then sometimes we'll see if you like this, you'll like this. So, <laughs> oh, I, as far as new stuff, uh, I just I just think Bill Hader is hitting it out of the park uh, repeatedly. Barry is so bizarre and so weird and so wonderful. It's such an extraordinary use of Henry Winkler's great talent. Mm -hmm. um, and just the cinematic challenges they pose for themselves as filmmakers. It, it is fantastic. Anyway, we got one of those, uh, if you like that, you'll like this. And so now we're knee deep in, in Six Feet Under, which we, oh, never, yes. which we never watched first time. Classic. Um... And, and uh, Barry is must be interesting for you though because I, now I, where I am is I just started season three so um, but I'm loving it. Uh, how much of that acting humor <laughs> lands for you? <laughs> they are they are just dissecting in the most beautiful, delicious, uh, smart, stupid way <laughs> all, all, all of the conceits that that are really uh west coast oriented and they're having fun with it making fun of it but they're doing it sort of with a reverence uh, at the same time it's just it's really masterful of uh, the way they're doing it what you, what you don't want to do when you're when you're having fun with something is to comment on it while you're doing it mm -hmm. but you want it to have that effect without telegraphing any uh, of of that from a comment standpoint i just think it's being brilliantly walked a very fine line uh and i'm i'm a huge fan and we have watched every uh, every frame of every episode that we've been allowed so far and we're we're waiting anxiously for the next one and hacks uh we're oh watching, yes we're watching every episode so of good. that and just <laughs> absolutely loving it so there is smart sensitive funny fun intense dramatic ev everything uh and it's and it's all um a beautiful collaboration of the writing the production uh and the and the actors and i need all of those elements uh to to stay glued to a, a, a screen large or small so uh, those are my criteria. And if you shop carefully, you can meet those criteria over and over and over again. There's some extraordinary product out there right now. And what a time, right, to, that we're in when it comes to media, because, you know, I, I grew up in New York City, uh, no cable, right? So I had, what, 
eight, nine basic channels. <laughs> and this was the era of when something came on, well, such as Transformers, if you missed the episode, that's it. You missed it unless you set your VCR yeah. <laughs> to record it. Um, and and then you would hope that the reruns come in the summer, right? And, and that was it. And once the show was off the air, maybe it would come out of VHS for $100 a day for something at some point. And now here we are where you on your desktop, you can just, or your television, you can just fire up five, six different channels filled with hundreds of hours of entertainment. Um, and, and it's a blessing and a curse, right? Because uh, I was at a, a Memorial Day barbecue not too long ago and, and people were asking each other, what are you watching? And we did what you and I are doing, which is we batted around different shows and things we enjoy. And there was so much overlap of us saying, I've seen the trailer for that. I haven't watched that yet, but I want to but I'm busy finishing this other thing <laughs> that has my attention. Right. We get, we get, uh, we get trapped. It becomes part of who we are for a period of time. Um, I mean, the joke, the, the joke that I make and not a joke, but I say, wait a minute in the, in the Spanish flu, they had no Netflix and no Amazon prime. <laughs> how did they survive? What, what, how did they survive? <laughs> And of course they read or they knitted or they, they did whatever you do uh, if you don't have that outlet available to you. But man, it, it, it is a, a, an extraordinary, it has been a great help. I'm not trying to, I don't want to put a, a, a time and date on this interview with you and I, hopefully it'll live forever. Uh, but we are, we are still in the throes of, of COVID and that's what I'm referring to is how much time isolation and and alone time we've all been extended and hopefully you you i mean it it, it tests a partnership or a marriage or mm -hmm. whatever because because uh, you you end up spending a lot of time at home at this period in our history and uh, happily uh, that's we're, we're a, lucky we have that, uh, you know and you've been a part of a lot of that entertainment that people could channel right now right uh, here here bravo I, mean, I hadn't thought of that i mean how many shows have you done that are probably streaming somewhere right now or oh. i could order a dvd off amazon or something uh or a video game you're in that i could load into my playstation and just start playing right i i love the sound of that and that <laughs> honestly hadn't hadn't reached the front of my mind yet that's that's great i like that uh, so last question, and this is usually how I end off. Um, I, I like to give the audience something to look forward to. I want to give you a chance to promote anything you're working on. What do we have to look forward to from you? Well, uh, I'm in that land where where the three letters that rule my life are NDA. Uh, <laughs> so the thing there are things I would love to talk about uh, and and I'm unable to. Uh, the funny thing about an NDA is when something is finally uh, completed and released and, and they say, why aren't you talking about it? You say, because, <laughs> because I just spent so much time not talking about it. Uh, so there, there is an end of the line, of course, with that stuff. Uh, conventions are continuing. They're starting to uh, reappear. I've done several this year. I have several more. Uh, again, not if we're putting a time and date on this interview, uh, this month I'm doing uh, a Joe Fest in Augusta, Georgia, uh, the third week of June, uh, early July, TFCon Toronto, end of July, uh, <laughs> the mother, the mothership, oh. San, Di San Diego Comic Con. Excellent. Be, yeah, I, I will be uh, bouncing around there. And uh, there are other things upcoming. I am loving uh, the coaching that I have been doing, uh, primarily with uh, professionals or, or people who are situated in a studio and have specific work that, that they're working on. It's, I'm very careful to call it coaching rather than teaching. Uh, that's where I think my strengths lie. And I, I, it, it really has been, uh, keeps me wide awake. And, um, and then I take a nice nap, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good nap. Uh, and and uh, so I'm doing what I have been doing and been allowed to do for the longest time. And uh, I enjoy being a part of this industry. I enjoy, uh, uh, honestly, uh, interviews like this. I enjoy all of the streaming opportunities that have made themselves available to me and continue to. I'm uh, I'm uh, 
always a fan of yours. I'm always happy to spend time time with you. And frankly, thank you. This, for you and I, this is a lot of time spent together. Yes, uh, yes, I, absolutely. I, I, this is, uh, I said this to you earlier is uh, before we started. Uh, it's one of the few times we've gotten to talk where you don't have 10 people try to grab your attention and I don't have five people try to grab my attention simultaneously. <laughs> we, we were trying to remember the last time we bumped into each other, which was, of course, a convention. But yeah. I was walking as fast as I could in one direction. <laughs> and and for, a, for a period of time, you were walking the same direction. Right. And, we were and then uh, we, we, we took the fork in the road and each went different, different I, I directions. I think the only time we have had anything resembling this was two times was one time first time we met uh you and i and a bunch of the other voice actor guests at vodka I were all did, hanging out I remember. the restaurant yes right? and we were sitting down <laughs> that was one of the yes. only times we got to do that and then uh, another time was at your table and i think it was either you were a coming back from something or going to something <laughs> so that's why you had a moment of calm <laughs> it, it it is it i mean it's such a wonderful adrenaline uh, period of time for both attendees and uh, special guests. I love being invited. I love going. I love, uh, you know, I, I, I know how many people stand in line uh, to say thank you, but I want all of them to know that I'm coming to say thank you as well. And I, I really like that one-on-one -on -one, uh, opportunity to just acknowledge uh, that that uh, that shared thing that we all have uh, you know it uh, it attracts very interesting people uh, and uh, I'm always interested in people who are interesting <laughs> <laughs> well speaking of interesting this has been a wonderful conversation Greg thank you so much for joining me today uh, it's been a blast I really appreciate your time my absolute pleasure like I said at the beginning, I only go where I'm invited. So th <laughs> thank you for inviting. Take care and stay safe. And the same. Thank you for watching my conversation with Greg Berger. I want to extend my sincerest appreciation to Greg for taking part in this interview series. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like down below. And if you like what I do, please consider subscribing to my channel. Kind comments are always appreciated as well. For now, once again, may your luster never dull and your wires never cross.